Hello everybody, welcome to Life to the Max. I'm Mike Max. On tonight's show, it's a special commitment made from father to son and son to father and son to many more people. Then later, we'll go down to Mississippi, Battle of Vicksburg, and how it changed the Civil War. How about this? The Night of the Living Bobbleheads. Then a bit later, we'll turn the Wayback Machine on to an interview done with the one and only Harmon Killebrew when he too was a young man. Stay with us on Life to the Max. Welcome to the show. It is the worst nightmare for a parent to have a son or daughter diagnosed with something that you're not sure you can overcome. What you do with that becomes paramount. For one father and one son, they made a bond, a promise to each other. And it's changed the lives of many. To understand why so many people are here to participate in a triathlon and to raise money for an organization called Pinky Swear, you have to understand where it started. Mitch was nine years old when he told his parents of a small issue. Well, it was June of 2002. We were sitting on our screen porch and um, we noticed a bump on his knee. We figured, let's just get an x-ray and figure out what's going on. Well, that x-ray turned into um, them needing to do a, a full PET scan and um, uh, a phone call that I'll never forget from my wife saying, you know what, we've got, you better get down here. Uh, they wanted to take a biopsy and um, as quick as they opened them up, they closed them up. Yeah. What did they see? Tumors. Oh, everywhere? Everywhere. What it meant was a diagnosis that offered little time and even less hope. They just said, um, uh, what your son has is osteosarcoma bone cancer. He has it from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head uh, without treatment until he's dead in 30 days. We can't save him. It's stage four. There's nothing we can do. Mitch's family, his parents and sister, went into a new mode. They began the process of chemotherapy and radiation. And they found out that people do care an awful lot. You know, we, did, we would do our daily blogs. I mean, I can remember coming home uh, from the hospital. We never left Mitch alone, ever. We never slept at the hospital alone. We were always there. What transpired next changed a life and changed lives. Just as we're sitting here right now, we could hear a family right next to us arguing about money and arguing about, what do you mean we can't afford Christmas gifts? What do you mean we can't do this? And Mitch is going, Dad, do you hear this? And it's like, buddy, it's none of our business. You know what? We have to just maintain as a family and worry about our own things. And he goes, nope. He said, we're gonna help them. He looked at me and he said, how much money do I have? I said, you've got about $6,000. And he said, where did I get it? I said, from people that love you. And he said, what can I do with that money? I said, what do you mean, what can you do with that money? He said, that's my money, right? Yep, it's your money. So I can give it away. Yep, you can do whatever you want. He said, when am I done with chemo? I said, tomorrow. And he said, I want to go to the bank when we're done. I want to get the money out and I want to give it away. And I said, whatever you want. Then he gave that money to every patient and family he thought needed it, almost the secret Santa, filling needs and creating joy and helping people get through the rough days. Then he sat his dad down and told him he wanted to do it again. And he said, Dad, promise me that we can do this next year. And I said, that's a big promise. And he said, I want to do this next year. And I said, you're not going to be here next year. And uh, so he looked at me and he said, after I'm gone, give me a pinky swear that you'll do this. Mitch did not get to see his 10th birthday, but pinky swear still lives. And it is doing exactly what Mitch wanted, to help. The vision for pinky swear is that we help kids with cancer and their families wherever they are to make a difference in their lives to provide 
a bright light in really a dark time for these families that are in need. For Lexi Murphy, it served as a support when she needed it most. So I ended up having a tumor on the base of my skull that was the volume of a golf ball, but not the same shape. So it was pretty large, because there's not any extra space in your head for anything else other than like your brain. And I had a very large mass in my skull. She had lymphoma. The oldest of four children raised by a single mother, Pinky Swear stepped in, in a big way. They really helped my family a lot because uh, my mom's a single mom of four. I'm the oldest of four children. And so they helped us out with rent one month, which was really nice because my mom couldn't work very much, you know. Yep. Single parent of four, and then I'm in the hospital all the time. So that was really helpful for us. And it was in December, and so that helped my mom with, like, Christmas. So they want this mission to be lived out, and they want people to understand through fundraisers like the triathlon that there are people that get it, that want to help. We don't recognize kids that for how much how fast they run, but we recognize kids on how much money they raise to help other kids. It's really about kids racing for kids who can't. Um, they provide, we connect them with a family, an all-star family to go out and help and raise money, and they're racing for um, a child that is sick and um, really is great leverage. We have last year in the Twin Cities, the kids alone here raised $600,000. Nelson is himself a cancer survivor, a husband and father of three, so he knows knows that life is not guaranteed, knows how it feels to be making a difference every day. How would you summarize your time here? Impactful, amazing. Um, yep, powerful. When you see it up close. Huh? Yep, seeing those families, um, seeing the difference that you're making in their lives, um, having some families come through and be survivors. That's why it was important that Steve started it all, to honor his son and to give himself purpose in the process. And all I care about is that when I die, hear me now, believe me later, I don't want my name on my headstone. I don't want anybody to know anything other than one simple thing. I want a real big headstone, and all I want it to say is I kept my promise. A promise that is being kept by thousands of people, now nationally, in so many different ways. We've had families that have been to the point that they had everything covered, but they couldn't cover the headstone for their child. And we have paid for that. We've done carpeting, a variety of different things to get them through a really, really challenging time. So that when it's over for those that ran the race, they will know, like Mitch, that they didn't waste their time on Earth, that they made it better. When we come back, we'll go down to Mississippi. Stay with us on Life to the Max. Life to the Max is brought to you by Life Touch. Photography for a lifetime.
Welcome back to Life to the Max. It may have been the most significant battle fought during the Civil War, the Battle of Vicksburg. When I'm dead and laid out on the counter. It's early summer, 1863, another hot, humid day on the banks of the Mississippi River. In the surrounding hills of Vicksburg, Mississippi, the greatly outnumbered Confederate Army is surrounded by General Ulysses S. Grant, 77,000 troops strong. Grant's strategy is to keep the town and his 30-some thousand troops in siege. Constant cannon bombardment from both his army and navy is the norm. Welcome to Vicksburg National Military Park. If not for what happened here 151 years ago, Old Glory would not be flying on that flagpole behind you. This, on this bloody ground, on this sacred ground, is where the turning point of the American Civil War took place in the spring and summer of 1863. The cannon fire is ongoing, and the people of Vicksburg will undergo this siege for 47 days. This last major stronghold on the Mississippi would not give up. Grant tried two major assaults in May of 63 to capture the fortress city, but both times the Union suffered major casualties and failed. He then decided on his siege strategy. The Confederates were cut off from all reinforcements and supplies. What he did here was successfully launch and execute the largest amphibious operation in the history of the world since Xerxes the Persian invaded Greece in what the Peloponnesian War is. It remained the largest amphibious operation until Operation Torch, the invasion of North Africa, the Allied invasion of North Africa in 1942. So he not only does this incredibly huge 50,000 men, combat troops crossing a two mile wide river with the assistance and support of the US Navy, but he does it 400 miles behind enemy lines, completely cut off from supplies and communication with, it, with the Union command uh, further upriver. The Union Navy under Rear Admiral David Porter bombarded the town of Vicksburg day in and day out with its new brown water navy and its shallow water ironclads. 100 years after the battle, one of these vessels, the USS Cairo, was salvaged and today is on display at Vicksburg Military Park. Seven of them are built in 100 days in two shipyards by James B. Eads. They utilize a pre-existing hull design. Uh, it's a hull design that is tried and true on the Mississippi. It's made for shallow water op operations. What the unique thing is about the warship you see behind me is from the water line up. It's what they call casemated or sloped armor. And behind that two and a half to three and a half inches of armor, you have approximately 23 inches of white oak. And that's all there to protect the weapon systems on this weapon pla weapons platform. Our Life to the Max roving reporter, Doug Anderson, got an up close and personal tour of the Cairo and its enormous cannons. A big, solid, floating gun barge, for lack of a better word. Very low speed, about nine knots coming down with the current of the Mississippi, going north against the current, a blistering top speed of about three knots. You can actually walk or jog faster than that. So the unique thing about this ship, though, is these cannons. These cannons protected behind the armor and the wood of the USS Cairo. Each of these cannons uh, varies in size from about 4,600 pounds down to about 1,000 pounds less than that, 3,500 pounds. During the siege, Union gunboats lobbed over 22,000 shells into the town, and Grant's army artillery fire was even heavier. With the town in shambles, the people were forced to dig caves in the yellow clay hills of Vicksburg. The living conditions were barely survivable. Yet despite this, only about a dozen citizens died during the 47-day ordeal. The outnumbered Confederate Army under Lieutenant General John Pemberton fought bravely. Confederate President Jefferson Davis called Vicksburg the nail head of the South and could not be lost under any circumstances. This impregnable city was greatly fortified. Uh, the fortifications, you have a firing step here where you can step up if you have a rifle and just shoot out with the headlog. You've just got the little narrow spot here you're exposing yourself to. Yeah. Once uh, the fighting actually begins here, after the initial Union assaults, you really have what we'd call today sniper fire going back and forth. Most of the injuries you have are head and shoulder wounds from then on out. Cannons also played a big role in the defense of Vicksburg. Jake, explain 
how the, the cannon worked. What are the uh, internal workings of it? Well, this gun's a 12-pound Napoleon. It's a smoothbore cannon. It's the most common one used during the war. The reason for that's the versatility and the ammunition. Uh, it fired the 12-pound solid shot, which is just a solid cannonball. Two exploding rounds, the shell here in the spherical case. The shell was filled with black powder with a fuse so it would explode in the air. Same thing with the spherical case, but it has 72 musket balls on the inside. It's actually developed by a British artillery officer named Henry Shrapnel. That's where the term we know today comes from. Then finally, it had a defensive round called canister, which is a tin can filled with 27 of these inch and a half cast iron balls. It turns that cannon into a giant shotgun. So that's when the enemy's close about to overrun you. Vicksburg was fought during the months of May, June, and July in the oppressive heat and humidity of the Deep South, and the Confederate uniforms were anything but ideal for these conditions. Confederate uniform is mainly composed of what I'm wearing, which is jeans wool. Uh, it's a mixture of cotton and wool. Uh, the Union Army is 100% wool, so they weren't trying to torture their soldiers. That was just the most durable material they had at the time. So you hold an actual well-made garment up in the air, you can see air coming through it. Uh, excuse me, sunlight coming through it. It's so breathed. It, it breathed right. really well, and with all the sweating we do, you feel the slightest breeze, and it's like instant air conditioning. <laughs> After a month and a half siege and massive loss of lives on both sides, the Confederates finally are forced to surrender as disease and starvation become unbearable. Grant's gamble pays off, and the Gibraltar of the South falls to the Union Army the 4th of July, 1863. This falls at the exact same time as Robert E. Lee's army loses at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. American history is forever changed. The Union was losing the war for the first couple of years. From 1861 up to 1863, uh, a series of generals in the East, bad campaigns, serious uh, defeats. Uh, Lincoln was looking at the very real possibility of the Confederacy winning the war, gaining their independence, and the United States being torn in two. So July 4th, 1863 is the turning point. From there on in, the Union begins to gain ground, gain strength, and one military victory after another, largely is in fact due to the leadership of General Ulysses S. Grant, who becomes the focus of uh, President Lincoln and the War Department because of his victories here uh, in, the, in the West, including Vicksburg. The spoils of the victory are enormous. Besides capturing 12% of all Confederate cannons, the North captures Vicksburg, it captures the river. Louisiana, Arkansas, Texas are now pretty much on their own. They're cut off. And because now there's a Union Army foothold down here, the, in, the uh, freed former enslaved people, the black slaves of Mississippi and Louisiana flock in because if they can come within the protection of Grant's Union Army, they are free. 30,000 uh, black troops become United States colored troops here at Vicksburg. So not only does the Confederacy lose an army of 30,000, the Union gains an army of 30,000 in Vicksburg, Mississippi. The surrender of Vicksburg was the turning point of the war for the North and a devastating blow to the South. And although the war would rage on almost another two years, it became apparent that the Union would remain intact. Life to the Max is brought to you by Life Touch. Photography for a lifetime.
Welcome back to Life to the Max. You've seen bobbleheads before and you've wondered as you watch them move, what are these guys thinking? Can they think? There's plenty of room for thought. We found out that at night when you go to bed, some strange things can go on with bobbleheads. When we come back, the way back machine with the killer, the one and only Harmon Killebrew, when he was just coming into his prime. Stay with us on Life to the Max. Life to the Max is brought to you by Life Touch, photography for a lifetime.
Welcome back to Life to the Max. Every once in a while, it's fun to look back at something that was way back and remember how it used to be. Harmon Killebrew, the bashful belter, the all-time home run leader for the Minnesota Twins and the Hall of Famer. But before there was Minnesota, there was the Washington Senators. And we found in our Wayback Machine in our archives an interview the killer did while he was a Washington Senator. Now what is the toughest play for you to make a third base? This is a bit of a switch for a guy that's hitting home runs. Well, I, of course, I think the toughest play for any third baseman is when you're playing back and a uh, fellow tops a ball, or what we call a swinging bunt. If you're playing back and he tops the ball, it's hard to come in quick and uh, get the man at first base. Now at this time, folks, uh, Harmon hit about 35 home runs, and I'm just wondering if there's one particular home run you remember more than anything else so far this year. The one that really gave you the biggest satisfaction of any that you've slugged out of a ballpark. <laughs> well, of course, I think uh, one that uh, stands out in my mind is uh, in Detroit. I hit a 10th inning uh, home run uh, to beat Jim uh, Bunning there. I That's think. the one that counts, and that answers the question to this extent. I don't think you're consciously sh uh, shooting for home runs every time you're up there, are you? No, that's the, I'm just trying to hit the ball and uh, let it go where, where it will. Harmon was a pretty fair football player as well. Lots of great memories already here from TCF Bank Stadium. Remember, you can look us up on the web at lifethemax.tv, and you can look us up and hopefully like us on Facebook. Thanks for watching. See you back here next week, everybody. Life to the Max is a production of Life Touch Media. For more information, visit our website at lifetothemax.tv.
Welcome to Vicksburg National Military Park.
bed and laid out on the counter. It's early summer, 1863. Another hot, humid day on the banks of the Mississippi River. In the surrounding hills of Vicksburg, Mississippi, the greatly outnumbered Confederate Army is surrounded by General Ulysses S. Grant, 77,000 troops strong. Grant's strategy is to keep the town and his 30-some thousand troops in siege. Constant cannon bombardment from both his army and navy is the norm. Welcome to Vicksburg National Military Park. If not for what happened here 151 years ago, Old Glory would not be flying on that flagpole behind you. This, on this bloody ground, on this sacred ground, is where the turning point of the American Civil War took place in the spring and summer of 1863. The cannon fire is ongoing, and the people of Vicksburg will undergo this siege for 47 days. This last major stronghold on the Mississippi would not give up. Grant tried two major assaults in May of 63 to capture the fortress city, but both times the Union suffered major casualties and failed. He then decided on his siege strategy. The Confederates were cut off from all reinforcements and supplies. What he did here was successfully launch and execute the largest amphibious operation in the history of the world since Xerxes the Persian invaded Greece in what the Peloponnesian Wars. It remained the largest amphibious operation until Operation Torch, the invasion of North Africa, the Allied invasion of North Africa in 1942. So he not only does this incredibly huge 50,000 men, combat troops crossing a two mile wide river with the assistance and support of the US Navy, but he does it 400 miles behind enemy lines completely cut off from supplies and communication with, with the Union command uh, further upriver. The Union Navy under Rear Admiral David Porter bombarded the town of Vicksburg day in and day out with its new brown water navy and its shallow water ironclads. 100 years after the battle, one of these vessels, the USS Cairo, was salvaged and today is on display at Vicksburg Military Park. Seven of them are built in 100 days in two shipyards by James B. Eads. They utilize a pre-existing hull design. Uh, it's a hull design that is tried and true on the Mississippi. It's made for shallow water op operations. What the unique thing is about the warship you see behind me is from the water line up. It's what they call casemated or sloped armor. And behind that two and a half to three and a half inches of armor, you have approximately 23 inches of white oak. And that's all there to protect the weapon systems on this weapon pla weapons platform. Our Life to the Max roving reporter Doug Anderson got an up-close and personal tour of the Cairo and its enormous cannons. A big, solid, floating gun barge, for lack of a better word. Very low speed, about nine knots coming down with the current of the Mississippi, going north against the current, a blistering top speed of about three knots. You can actually walk or jog faster than that. So the unique thing about this ship, though, is these cannons. These cannons protected behind the armor and the wood of the USS Cairo. Each of these cannons uh, varies in size from about 4,600 pounds down to about 1,000 pounds less than that, 3,500 pounds. During the siege, Union gunboats lobbed over 22,000 shells into the town, and Grant's army artillery fire was even heavier. With the town in shambles, the people were forced to dig caves in the yellow clay hills of Vicksburg. The living conditions were barely survivable. Yet despite this, only about a dozen citizens died during the 47-day ordeal. The outnumbered Confederate Army under Lieutenant General John Pemberton fought bravely. Confederate President Jefferson Davis called Vicksburg the nail head of the South and could not be lost under any circumstances. This impregnable city was greatly fortified. Uh, the fortifications, you have a firing step here where you can step up if you have a rifle and just shoot out with the headlog. You've just got the little narrow spot here you're exposing yourself to. Yep. Once uh, the fighting actually begins here, after the initial Union assaults, you really have what we'd call today sniper fire going back and forth. Most of the injuries you have are head and shoulder wounds from then on out. Cannons also played a big role in the defense of Vicksburg. Jake, explain how the, the cannon worked? What are the uh, internal workings of it? Well, this gun's a 12-pound Napoleon. It's a smoothbore cannon. It's the most common one used during the war. The reason for that's the versatility and the ammunition. 
I fired the 12 pound solid shot, which is just a solid cannonball. Two exploding rounds, the shell here in the spherical case. The shell was filled with black powder with a fuse so it would explode in the air. Same thing with the spherical case, but it has 72 musket balls on the inside. It's actually developed by a British artillery officer named Henry Shrapnel. That's where the term we know today comes from. Then finally it had a defensive round called canister, which is a tin can filled with 27 of these inch and a half cast iron balls. It turns that cannon into a giant shotgun. So that's when the enemy's close about to overrun you. Vicksburg was fought during the months of May, June, and July in the oppressive heat and humidity of the Deep South, and the Confederate uniforms were anything but ideal for these conditions. Confederate uniform is mainly composed of what I'm wearing, which is jeans wool. Uh, it's a mixture of cotton and wool. Uh, the Union Army is 100% wool, so they weren't trying to torture their soldiers. That was just the most durable material they had at the time. So you hold an actual well-made garment up in the air, you can see air coming through it. Uh, excuse me, sunlight coming through it. So it, it breathed right. really well, and with all the sweating we do, you feel the slightest breeze, and it's like instant air conditioning. <laughs> After a month and a half siege and massive loss of lives on both sides, the Confederates finally are forced to surrender as disease and starvation become unbearable. Grant's gamble pays off, and the Gibraltar of the South falls to the Union Army the 4th of July, 1863. This falls at the exact same time as Robert E. Lee's army loses at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. American history is forever changed. The Union was losing the war for the first couple of years, from 1861 up to 1863, uh, a series of generals in the East, bad campaigns, serious uh, defeats. Uh, Lincoln was looking at the very real possibility of the Confederacy winning the war, gaining their independence, and the United States being torn in two. So July 4th, 1863 is the turning point. From there on in, the Union begins to gain ground, gain strength, and one military victory after another largely is, in fact, due to the leadership of General Ulysses S. Grant, who becomes the focus of uh, President Lincoln and the War Department because of his victories here uh, in, the, in the West, including Vicksburg. The spoils of the victory are enormous, besides capturing 12% of all Confederate cannons. The North captures Vicksburg, it captures the river. Louisiana, Arkansas, Texas are now pretty much on their own. They're cut off. And because now there's a Union Army foothold down here, the, in, the uh, freed former enslaved people, the black slaves of Mississippi and Louisiana flock in because if they can come within the protection of Grant's Union Army, they are free. 30,000 uh, black troops become United States colored troops here at Vicksburg. So not only does the Confederacy lose an army of 30,000, the Union gains an army of 30,000 in Vicksburg, Mississippi. The surrender of Vicksburg was the turning point of the war for the North and a devastating blow to the South. And although the war would rage on almost another two years, it became apparent that the Union would remain intact. Life to the Max is brought to you by Life Touch, photography for a lifetime.